Welcome to another episode of the Emulsion Podcast, a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and I'd love to continue the conversation with you from this episode on my online circle community. There you can share your two cents and learn about supporting the show on justinkana.com slash support. For your convenience, it's also linked up in the description of your podcast player. Let's get into the show. My guest today is Kendall Beach, the kitchen producer for the Babish Culinary Universe, a channel on YouTube with almost 9 million subscribers, known far and wide on the interwebs for shows like Binging with Babish, Basics with Babish, lots of bees, and Stump Sola. Kendall and I met when Andrew Ray, who is the Babish in question, shared that he hired her out of the Culinary Institute of America, which is also the culinary school that I uh, attended, and I immediately gave her a follow, and I come to find out that her partner Theo is a fan of the channel, and I also had to, you know, reach out after hearing her on the Line Cook Thoughts podcast and ask for an interview opportunity. So, if at any point you would like to pause and check out Kendall online or any of the specific linkable things that we discuss, please do check out the show notes, which are always Always available in the description of the podcast or on justincona.com slash media. Kendall, thank you so much for taking the time. No, thank you for having me on. I'm excited. I don't know if you feel this, but every time I sit down to have a conversation with somebody that either produces content or line, it's more YouTube specifically, but I feel like a, a wizard in the Harry Potter universe that's just kind of like met another wizard. Not, but not in like a we have powers and other people that don't mm-hmm, produce mm-hmm. content are, are muggles kind of way. It's just, it's just it's a very rare occurrence and I always like to, to geek out. And so I'm very, very excited to chat and I, I have tons of questions for you. I, I thought a fun place to start would be to kind of, I know you had a change of heart in culinary arts and to get a sense of your background and you can of course feel free to add stories to to give some color to this but when did you know that you could produce for real for real for real and you can change that verb if direct or script or perform maybe is the right word for you but when did you know that it was really something that like I can do this uh great question first of all (laughs) um uh, oh, wow. I, I think it was kind of more of a gradual understanding of what uh, I wanted from my life and what kind of passions I could bring together to make something a career. Um, so if you don't know, if people don't know, why would they? Uh, I went to I, my background, really. Um, a, growing up, I was really a theater nerd. I loved it. Um musicals, although I can't sing for the life of me, but uh, plays, I just, I really caught the acting bug, probably, I don't know, age 13 or something. Um, And I figured that that would be kind of my life path. So I went to college for it. I very, um, I was very fortunate to get into the Boston University College of Fine Arts and a wonderful, great school. I very, very quickly figured it out that it wasn't for me. Um, And that's, (laughs) It was kind of a tough mistake to make, but a really important one for me. Um, and so from there, I kind of looked at my life choices, like what what can I really go from here? Um, and I, you know, tooled around doing a few other majors. And by that, I mean, I took like an earth science class sure. and a communications class. And uh, my favorite part of my day was going home and cooking for myself and specifically baking. That's really kind of um, where my heart lies. Uh, I, I love the technical aspect of it and that, that makes my math brain happy. Um, so from there, I just, I, I said, I got to do this for the rest of my life. I got to figure out how, and I, for a long time, actually thought that I was going to work in a bakery or, or kind of go, you know, what you'd imagine. Oh, you love baking. That's what you go on to do. And so I went to culinary school, culinary Institute of America, you know it. And I, initially actually I thought I'd just do the baking and pastry program and then I think I sat on like a seminar something you know the school has a million of those for their bachelor's programs and culinary science just sounds incredible um it definitely again made my math brain really happy and so I figured I'd stand to do that and looking into that and um my parents came from business marketing background so when I kind of brought up the subject of research and development, they were like, oh yeah, no, no, we get that. You should totally do that. Because, sure. you know, up until then, acting, baking was totally foreign to them. 
and therefore scary, you know, I get it. Um, so I kind of went deep down into that. And uh, as part of um, the culinary uh, program, you spend a semester doing externship. And I went <laughs> to San Francisco and I worked at a really small boutique R&D firm. Uh, you couldn't have asked for a better experience of like really learning the process of that. And what was the name of the firm? Again, I'd be, I'd be um, missed if I didn't ask. Yes. Uh, well, they recently went, not recently, probably two years ago, actually went through a bri like a, they got, they merged and then they demerged. It was sure. sad. It was a very quick marriage, but they are currently CCD, which is culinary. I don't remember. I'll put it in the show notes. You can send me a link and we'll, we'll oh, no. pop it in the show notes for people. Okay. Well, we call it CCD. CCD it is. They changed it so many times. It was CCDI for innovation. Culinary Embarrassing. Science. Okay. I'm looking it up. CCD okay, innovation? Thanks. Yes, that's what it was when I was there. <laughs> I'm looking. And it was really cool, actually. It probably, oh, yes. uh, I, I see Chef's Council. Okay, they have a Chef's Council, and that's what was really cool about them is that they developed products, but they really wanted to have it, you know, grow from a place of true culinary excellence. So they bring in chefs to develop their products, create like a prototype, and then they kind of take it from there right. to uh, commercialize it. And that was really cool. And I really great learning experience. But again, <laughs> learned really quickly, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, I went back to school and I had like two more semesters to figure out what I wanted to do. And I, I don't know what it was, but something was kind of just nagging on my heart that I still really loved the aspect of performing. And I wondered if there was any way that I could, you know, bring those two things together of, of cooking, pastry and performing. And... I really, I don't even know where, where it came from, but I, I guess I was on YouTube and I saw that there were so many cooking channels. And I was like, well, I would love to do that. How do I even begin to get into that? Um, and I graduated from my pastry program, still was like, I'm full on food media. That's what I want to do. Curious as to why I continued on to culinary, ba uh, culinary science bachelors, because that really just has nothing to do with food media at all but I found it interesting and I actually think it's been really helpful to move my job right now because it's kind of really about the science of food and breaking it down and really for me it was a way of um figuring out the best way to explain how cooking works because I think it can be really daunting to people and I guess this is really not the right audience for that because you know most people listening here love cooking and get it um but you know for a really huge portion of this country, of the world, you know, um, we've gotten to a place where we don't really have to know how to cook. We have so many other options. And so it can seem really scary. And I was definitely one of those people up until I decided I wanted to go to culinary school. And so I just, I don't know, my, my heart really felt that that was kind of the way to go. I really wanted to perform. I wanted to bake. And I really wanted to help people, you know, learn themselves so I, I want to get into your transition to yeah. Babish in a second yeah. but there's like yeah. a couple of points that you that you brought up that I want to kind of like double click on and and the first one is I did something very similar when I moved from Europe back to Seattle and someone on a podcast I was listening to I can't remember the name put a put a, a phrase to it that really kind of like made me say oh yeah that's I guess I guess that's what I did it didn't feel like it at the time but it was and they called it a portfolio of opportunities very similar to how like a VC looks at investing in projects from the sense of like, they pick a ton of them, understanding that a lot of them will probably go to zero and they will be just be complete waste of time. Or you might learn something out of, out of the whole thing. Yeah. You know, the, the classic thing of like, it's not a failure, it's a learning, but like you seem like you were very like quick to say yes to things, really dive into them and, and then almost adopt that kind of like fail fast mentality can can you mm -hmm. speak a little bit to that because i think that like a lot of people will have 
all those cognitive biases work against them, right? Sunk cost, you know, like, uh, you know, maybe there's just this, this is something that I should work on and improve. It's just part of the process kind of thing. But from all those stories, it just sounds like you, you didn't approach it that way. You're just like, nope, this is not for me. I'm going to kind of move on to the next thing or seek out another opportunity, I guess, is the more optimistic way to phrase that. So were you thinking like that or, or is that, that, that a hindsight, you know, kind of reflection? Um, I think it's definitely a, it, I'd say it's 90% hindsight. Um, I think that in my life I've been, and by the way, you just really hit the nail on the head there. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite, I'm a headstrong person, stubborn, better word. There you go. And <laughs> I, um, I get really into projects, but ideas, I guess. Um, I'm a real dreamer as my 11th grade um, history teacher told me, um, Bill Meyer. Um, and so, so I get my head wrapped around ideas and, you know, the, the other side of me is very much a, a realist and like, okay, well, that's what you want to do, make it happen. And so I, I try to do that. And I try to try as much as I can. Um, but I guess, uh, there's something in me that realizes, okay, okay, okay you do not like this <laughs> and we got to figure out a problem solving way to get around this. So uh, maybe, maybe if I'm going to be quite honest with you, I make decisions a little too quickly. Um, maybe if I, you know, stayed at my original college for longer, maybe things would have turned out a different way. Or maybe if I had worked at a different firm and realized that, you know, R and D can look different ways. Maybe I kind of would have stayed on, on that path. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm extremely happy where I am. Um, I can't say I, you know, I, I've come from a place where, um, I'm lucky enough to be able to try a lot of different things. And there are a lot of people out there that aren't. And so I, I don't want to say try every single thing that you can and say no, as soon as you want to, because well, that's what I've done. And I've been lucky enough to do that. I know that that's just not really a reality for most people. Well, you have tons of time left as well in your career and yeah. just life. I mean, mm -hmm. both of us do realistically, right? But but I think that mm -hmm. that that ability to adopt that mindset so young gives you a lot of. Um, it can prevent you from sinking too much time into certain projects, right? And not just that, but uh, I mean, it's just it gives you the opportunity to find the true thing that's right. And, and I think the other thing that we'll get into later as we're talking about like your day to day is that like, there aren't, it's, it's not to say that there isn't, there aren't elements of your work that you don't like. And every single part of your job is perfect and hunky dory. There's just like every single thing that you should dislike. You should actually lean into the dislike of that thing. I would, I would at least hope. Um, like I like yeah. doing dishes. I just like doing dishes. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. who hate doing dishes and I'm sure that there's certain elements of your job that are probably the same. So it's not, and that's such a hard balance, right? Because you want people to be able to acknowledge like, this isn't working. I need to move on. Or mm -hmm. this is just the part of it that I don't like. And I just need to kind of like push through it to kind of get to the parts that I do like the, the piece from CIA that I was interested in speaking to you mm -hmm. on, and I'm dating myself by telling you this, but like, the, the culinary science program launched the year after I graduated from CIA. So okay. it did not, it was, it did not exist mm -hmm. as an option for me. It was a very experimental program that I could have stayed on for had I waited, you know, six mm -hmm. months and not done restaurants. Uh, believe it or not, the head chef of single thread was the instructor, uh, Kyle Connaughton, just legend. It was like the instructor. Wow. And had I known what he was going to go on to do, I probably mm -hmm. would have made very different decisions. He was coming from, I think the, the, the culinary science firm that he was running, um, which is very interesting. But I was curious, what was missing for you from CIA or what did you feel like was missing that you wanted to see more of out of that experience? From the school in general? Yeah. Just your whole school experience, if, if anything, because, um, a lot of a lot of people listening are like considering going to culinary school mm -hmm. or CCIA is kind of like the beacon, the 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 gold standard of, of education. And it's not to ask you to shit talk the school, but just, you know, <laughs> everybody has a different experience. So I can name my things that I thought was missing, but I'd be curious yours. I, I think it's it, it's hard to say. I I'll start here. This is going to be long winded and I apologize in advance. We have the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing that. I'm most thankful for, for my, you know, experience at CIA is that really, really nailed into me. 
um, commitment. And as we've talked about history in my life is that um, uh, I fall fast into things and I get out quickly. Mm -hmm. And while that's, you know, benefited me and I've been able to figure out what I want and what I don't want, um, I was definitely missing the part of my life where I just really had to like sit down, do the work and and show up. Um, And that's real, like that's, wow. It, It changed me as a person and I'm, I am forever, forever thankful. So even though there, there are things about the school that, you know, certain classes, certain teachers, certain, I should call them chefs is what they Mm. are. Um, (laughs) things that I disagree with and, um, don't think were beneficial to my overall learning. Um, I, I, it was all incredibly essential to teach me the lesson I really needed to learn. Um, so that's not a critique. (laughs) No, I'll answer it's your question. Not necessarily looking for one, but I, I to get a to get a, you know, a, a snapshot of one's experience at a school like that, I think is valuable for someone who's considering it. Because you know, at the second that you get cookied from CIA, they're sending you materials for days yeah. on this is the best thing yeah. you're ever going to do for your yeah. career. And, um, I mean, even the the program I went through and the program you weren't went through are very different. And I yeah. think that's great from the sense of like it's. Mm-hmm hopefully improving every single year, but, um, it's also very expensive and I like to be real with people, but your, your point of, and I tell people this, that it's like for people that thrive in structure, culinary school is freaking amazing because Mm -hmm. that's what it gives you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and as far as the actual education goes, um, I, I think it's great for me coming from, and I, I'm not sure if it was this way for you. For me, it didn't require any like previous experience at all. I'd have six months, which is yeah, which it's a mixed bag because mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, I showed up and my class was maybe I was 19 at the time. Most kids were at 17, 18, so I wasn't really that much older than them. But having a little bit of like um, traditional like college experience, I definitely thought helped me. Um, as far as having any culinary experience, there are people there who like, you know, run their own businesses before me, uh, who are like 24, 26, 30. Um, and they definitely, definitely <laughs> were way past the rest of us. Um, but for me, I was able to, and a lot of my peers who were just right out of high school, the program really went, you know, an inch deep, a mile wide. Right. Um, and that's, it's, that's, I think that's really, um, what it's good at, you know, mm-hmm. it, it gives you a general knowledge of a lot of things. And that general knowledge is, you know, more than your average Joe down the street, but it's, you're not really going to learn anything super in depth from it, unless you really, you know, go the extra mile and you go and talk to your chefs who I, at least the ones I had nine out of 10, there'd be more, more than, I, I just have a few, few chefs who I asked them questions and that was my big thing that like, I just wanted to be able to ask questions, which some of these chefs that was like extremely discouraged which I don't understand, but I guess that that's a old, you know, kitchen culture Mm -hmm. relic or, you know, actually a reality in some kitchens today, of course. Um, You and I, I guess, are separated from that, luckily, right now. Um, But at a learning institution, that is bizarre to me that that would be something that was discouraging. Like, I'd be straight out told, like, I don't care about your question. Okay, I pay a lot of money to go here. You should. One. Two, human being, you have knowledge. I don't. Please give it to me. And three, like, what, what what do you want me to get out of this as a professor and I'm your student? So, you know, it's a mixed bag. It's I would like to say that all the professors were really wonderful and all the chefs were, you know, would be more than willing to stay with you if you needed it. But that's not really always the case. And that's not always the case in real life either. So that's also a lesson to learn. You brought up a great point as well from I call it how to talk about food but you brought it up in the context of like research and development with and and the point I'm trying to make is like you're not always cooking for chefs and I think that chefs often fall in the trap of thinking that because you know the dish that they R&D and cook up on the past the single one that they taste and say this is the one we're going to run on the menu tonight it isn't often thought through especially when you're early on that you have to communicate that to all the 
of course all the chefs, but then you have to communicate that to the front of house people that are going to be talking about this dish next to the table. Uh, you have to talk about it with the guest. If so, you go out to table number 13 and you talk to that guest about the dish that you just created. Or a food media person calls you and asks to do a piece on you and you have to share about that dish. And so using that as kind of like a leading question, you've mentioned writing as a way to kind of get your foot in the door, not just with building an audience, but as kind of like a way to build assets for you to show future prospects or you know, as a, as a fun way to introduce someone to you and your work and potentially hire you. I love the quote of improve your, to improve your thinking, improve your writing. What else has writing taught you? I think I, as part of my job now, um, I do a lot more writing than I ever did in my like own personal life. And it's taught me a lot about the way I communicate. And I, I'm, I'm the kind of writer that, um, I write the way I speak, which isn't always, there's a time and a place and that's just not always what you're supposed to do, but that's definitely my voice. Um, and so as much as I've come to terms with that and luckily in my job and, um, you know, are similarly, we can do that. That's a luxury, but it's also made me realize the flaws in how I communicate verbally. So, um, I'll be writing down a recipe or something similar. I wouldn't know what else do I write? I write down recipes. <laughs> um, and I realize if I'm not the one reading this or even if it's somebody else, so like I can write down recipes and Andrew will read it or I'll just like read him what I've written. He'll take it in a totally different way than I meant it Interesting. to. And it's just, it's literally that our brains just work differently. We have a similar knowledge base but it's just, it's, it's communication and I think it's, I'm still working it out, but it's incredibly valuable to have not just, you know, someone else point that out to you, but to like you point it out to you. That's been really helpful for me. You strike me and we haven't worked together, full disclaimer, but you strike me as a very helpful and proactive coworker just based on like the little behind the scenes TikToks mm -hmm. and, you know, just the way that you talk <laughs> about working with Andrew You've shared that you aren't the most technologically savvy person. You've shared that mm -hmm. you're not the most technical chef in the in the kitchen. Can you speak a little bit about playing to your strengths in this role versus dwelling on your weaknesses? Um, so actually, this kind of connects to a point that you made earlier um, about, you know, as a chef, being able to communicate to people who don't have the same knowledge base. And I think for me, even though I've been to culinary school and I, I do have a greater knowledge than the average person of food. I, I still think I have a great base of, I don't know what I'm doing. And I think that for what I'm doing and the channel I'm a part of, you know, our audience isn't chefs. And so that's, I, I think having that mind frame and trying to, trying to keep that, um, is one of my strengths. And as much as I, I always try to learn more and Andrew teaches me and, my boyfriend, Tyle, he teaches me a lot. Um, he, he works at an incredible fine dining restaurant and he comes home and tells me about what he's making and how he makes it. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. And I love that. And I love learning more and I love reading, but I definitely always want to keep that mindset of, of what is this? <laughs> how, how can I communicate this to somebody that doesn't know what I'm talking about? doesn't have any kind of reference to go off of. Um, Additionally, <laughs> my other strengths, I, as much as I did just shit on it, um, <laughs> uh, I, I do think I'm an okay communicator. I'm going to scratch that. No, I'm a good, avid, developed communicator. There you go. I'll say. Yeah. I have to take, that's as, as I'm working on it, is being able to take, you know, take charge and say, I'm good at this. You know, I think, sure. whatever, I'm not going to go into the whole psychological issue of, being a young person, being a woman and all of those things. Right. But um, yeah, I, I try, I try to keep myself up, but uh, I'm not the best at many things, but I'm good at what I do. And I think what I'm good at is a combination that's unique. I think being easier to work with is something that you can't necessarily put next to an accolade. Like I'm the most easy to work with person yeah. in the office <laughs> or at the company, but it's mm -hmm. like, it's in, in, in all my experience, it's so underrated. Like, 
and you know certain chefs are, are getting savvier at being able to hire for it from the perspective of like screening for attitude and having real you know casual conversations with this person and how do they hold up because i think that there's an endless slew of people who can just like white knuckle their way through the day and then the second that you try to communicate them or at god forbid ask them to talk to a guest you know like they just can't seem to and and again it's not to say that everybody has to be everything but um yeah i just wanted to call that out and, and your 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 self-awareness and i know that you didn't want to really get into it but it's like keep leaning into it like I don't know if, if I can give you any advice, like, uh, yeah. just yeah. keep, keep, I, I know you're doing it, but it's like, it's so valuable. It's so, I don't know, a huge fan of it. And it's helped me immensely. So as much no, as you're apologetic you. about it, don't stop. Doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really appreciate it. I, I being able to have my job and meet people like you and get advice. is just, it's, um, just like the greatest perk. <laughs> You know, and it's, I don't know, I guess it's the spice of life. It's totally. the best part. I wanted to get your thoughts on this concept because I, I certainly got pounded into my brain that food is either a art or a craft, but increasingly we're starting to see food become an entertain, become entertainment from these solo creators. So the way I define this as food that is not from a competition challenge food that you will watch being made but you will never eat it or chefs that you see online but you can't actually go book a table to go eat your guys's uh, dinner from WandaVision right mm -hmm. am i am i missing something there of of this third category starting to emerge or or is that actually where things are heading in your mind it's t it's definitely something that i think about and i grapple with and it's it's a very odd thing coming from a place of, you know, culinary school where hospitality is number one and, you know, you're, you're feeding somebody, you're, you're, you have a vision and you're executing and then at the end of the day, it's because somebody's going to eat it. And that's really, not, you're exactly what you're talking about is that food for entertainment that is not for somebody to eat at the end of the day. And yeah, is there a caveat in there is that you're, you're trying to educate and maybe one day that they are going to make that and then they're going to eat their food that's based off of what you made, right? Mm. Sort of backwards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a really odd concept of it is, is food is now a category of like in the realm of sports entertainment, you know? And that's, I, I don't know, it, it's a hard place and it's also... It conflicts with um, an ethical standpoint. You know what I'm talking about? Sure. And uh, I, I mean, I, I don't really know. I mean, things are going to progress as they are, but I don't know as creators how we combat that or if we should, you know, because this, this is our livelihood. So maybe we just don't touch it. I don't really know the answer. I don't think there is an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. it, we can, you and I can sit around in, in 2047 and say, yep, this is <laughs> definitely, that was the answer. But mm -hmm. I, I think that the thing that I noticed that's changed, or at least that wasn't around when I got into food, is this concept that like food media, when I started cooking in 2009, 2008, 2009, was something that you could maybe do for like six months. Or maybe you'd get a deal, but you wouldn't get the deal unless you got past the gatekeepers. And what was required to get past the gatekeepers was restaurants or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think now you could start a food media business, a channel, a blog, a podcast or whatever. And you could do it till 2047 and not serve a single meal at a pop-up or a restaurant or whatever. You could realistically have a 30 or 20 or whatever year career and it's very realistic to do that if you started now and i think that's what's different about it and we don't know what the yeah. secondary effects are of that yet whereas yeah. if you were to you know tell someone 10 years ago that you wanted to do a food media project it was like okay maybe you get renewed for a second season or like maybe mm -hmm. you get cast on this other show but it will it's like it's like the there's the fuse was very short you know it was like you it, it'd run out and then you would kind of mm -hmm. skid along the asphalt and you'd have to like get back up again and go back to your restaurant kind of thing mm -hmm. whereas now it's just completely it's actually possible now which is again like something I'm certainly grappling with because I had it in my head for years and years and years that I was going to have a restaurant and that was going to be my mm -hmm. thing and now it's just like 
everything is pointing away from that idea. And so Mm -hmm. I certainly grapple with it as well. I don't know if you have other thoughts to share on that. It feels almost like a natural progression Mm -hmm. um, in a way in that it's actually a very unnatural thing that we're doing. Um, But I think in every other industry, that's something that happens all the time. And it's, you know, it's expected, like whatever you go in to do, we don't expect to do it. But up until recently, the culinary industry was, it was restaurants, you know, or maybe you could be a corporate chef or maybe, mm-hmm. maybe go into R and D there are <laughs> few. Um, but now there's this whole new universe and there's room for people to do exactly what you've done to be steered in a different direction and still have the possibility of a career and not just possibility, but you know, a reality. And it's not zero sum either. That's what I think is fascinating about it is that just because um, binging with Babish was a channel, Joshua Weissman could come along and mm-hmm. also get millions of subscribers. And then my friend Matt and my friend Adam are also coming along and getting hundreds of thousands of subscribers. It's mm-hmm. like, it's not just because there's one big dog in town. Like there's, yeah. it's, you're not competing with the eight o'clock slot on Food mm-hmm. Network, you know, like Emeril yeah. had that yeah. slot for years and years and years because he was the guy, you know, uh, and so it's it's not zero sum either, which I think is clearly something you and I are both uh, huge fans of. Yeah. To to kind Absolutely. of yeah. <laughs> to kind of uh, move into into your work with Andrew and with the channel. I might be projecting some of my past bad experiences with this question. Chefs often have this misconception that they can quote unquote just hire someone to do social media for them. And I saw this funny post on Twitter the other day that was like. A, they clearly maxed out all 280 characters, but it was like a 12 bullet list of all the skills that are required to run a well-positioned brand online. And this was more talking about being a solo creator in the creator economy. I can only imagine the sense of relief that comes from working for someone that understands what it's like to do what you do. Can you speak to that a bit and just maybe your, your work with Andrew, maybe how you got the job? Does that, yeah, does that resonate or, or I, I wouldn't dare say that, uh, I'm even in the realm of what Andrew does. He, <laughs> who, no, <laughs> uh, he sees the matrix. Interesting. While I'm still in a corner, you know, it's just, it's, um, I learn every, it's crazy that w- what you were just talking about earlier about that, you know, it's, it's not a zero sum is that, you know what's the phrase, the rising tide. Sure. Lifts all the boats. What, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's a beautiful thing about YouTube. And, you know, I, I didn't even like have a concept of that at all until a week ago. <laughs> um, so it, it's great. Um, to answer your question, I can kind of go into how I got my job. Yeah. Um, so where do we leave off? I was in bachelor's. Yep. I want to do food media. No idea how to go about it. Um, I reached out to actually, um, Erin McDowell, who, if you know, she, uh, works with New York times, who 52, uh, she released a book recently, her pie book, great pie is my favorite dessert. (laughs) I'm really pumped. (laughs) Um, but I reached out to her because she was also an alum and, uh, she basically, she was very sweet. First of all, she responded to me, wasn't expecting that. Um, and she's basically like, uh, I'm sorry, I don't really know what advice to give you because I got my start doing, um, working for CIA had like an editorial department where they published their books and they've done away with that since then. So she worked there for five years and that was kind of like her jumping stone. And, you know, she wished me luck. It was very sweet. Um, okay. doesn't help me. (laughs) Very sweet though. Um, so I just like really just started sending out applications to, I, I mean, I guess I shouldn't name them, but they were crazy applications. Like one of them, I don't know if I talked about it in different podcasts, but um, one of them asked me to uh, describe the most unique thing about me in 150 characters or less, which is like a sentence. I think you said 40 characters or less in that interview, which is even worse. It's even harder. Like 40 characters. I mean, talk about writing skills. I think I I lied. I think pretty sure it was 150. 150 seems more reasonable. 40 just seems like like a... That's like yeah, a, 40 just not seems many unrealistic. Letters. Yeah. Yeah. No, I definitely lied. It was 150. Yeah, that's fine. You um, come you come to this podcast yeah. for the real the real facts. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I saved it. Just kidding. We love you, Sorry, Ray. Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean to, Ray. Um, but yeah, like it was just like ridiculous things like that. And I was like, okay, this is just the rat race. And so many of my friends who had just graduated from like my high school friends who had graduated from college and gone into like advertising, whatever, like they were complaining like six months earlier about that. I was like, yeah, I don't have to do that. Well, here I was. And uh, I went on CIA's like job application site, which is Culinary Connect, famously, not great. Um, but I found the posting from uh, Maiden Network for a uh, kitchen producer. And so I applied, not doing my due diligence, because why would I do that? <laughs> um, and I applied and I had my first interview. It's like, okay, I should really look into what they do. And I realized it was a YouTube network and they had a bunch of different creators. Um, I was looking at the food ones and they had a few of them, but obviously I recognized Benjamin Savage. I was like, nah, no way it's that one. And it was, spoiler, um, and I had a few interviews and it was great. And I basically just explained uh, from my, like what, what I thought I was good at, <laughs> what much like I was trying to describe to you earlier, um, trying to combine my love of performing um, with cooking. And I was, I'm pretty sure, People, Andrew can correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm pretty sure I said I don't have very much experience with like actual technical production. I've taken production classes, but actually like going through and doing it, nada. And uh, they were totally understanding and they brought me on. And my first week, um, I actually started while I was still in school. It was during the weird COVID like lockdown, but we're going to do classes from home. So I had some time and so I ended up going in for a week because I needed a few extra hands, just two. And um, I didn't mean to make a bad joke, but it happened. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Uh, I was, yeah, I was, thank you, thrown into the total deep end. We were like knee deep in like all these shoots. And thankfully for me, it was like all planned out. And I would just had to like go in and do my job. And I did it. And I was like, wow, this was the best best ever basically all I did is I had me sing and I, I was there and I got to watch the shoots that was really the most valuable thing I could do is like learning how the process of what they do and they had a, a director up and um from Nashville uh and so it was just, it was like really like a mini crew and uh you know it was weird because it was coded but like it, it really felt like I was a part of a real job <laughs> like really doing something um, and then a few weeks later, I saw those episodes go up and it was like such like a payoff of like, it's so satisfying. I worked on that. I saw, yeah, exactly. Um, and what, pretty much I started really soon after that and I did pretty much the same thing. I wasn't really heavy into uh, video planning. I kind of like, was told like, this is what we're going to film. And I just prepped for it, grocery shop, cleaned, you know, basic stuff. Um, but the really wonderful thing about um, working for a small company is that um, as you grow and as you take on, you know, different roles is that I, I, my job has been able to expand with that. So now I do a lot more than I originally was. And I get to be a part of the conversation with video planning. Not that it was ever like, I was, you know, not a part of the, it wasn't invited to the conversation. I absolutely was, but I was like still trying to figure out what I'm doing here. Get your feet. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So now I'm able, you know, everyone, um, at Binge Entertainment <laughs> and uh, at uh, Maiden are very collaborative people. So um, it, it's been really wonderful to be able to take that on. And I, I kind of can dip my toes into the production, but not in that I actually do anything. <laughs> I just, I, I'm able, I understand it a bit better. And, you know, the reasoning behind certain decisions and like sometimes, so uh, ooh, I don't, I don't want to say anyone's name, right? I shouldn't say people's oh, names. Good. Yeah, don't. Oh, actually, well, no, no, wait. Because oh. Andrew literally said her name in New York Times article. I could say Jess. His <laughs> Perfect. Jess. Got it. So <laughs> Jess will be filming something and uh, she'll ask me like hold something or just like, you know, and she'll be fiddling with settings. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for bearing with it. You're, you're, yeah. you're learning here that, you know, <laughs> I don't want to claim that I'm an expert at anything that I literally don't know anything about. Yeah, but, but I mean, even I'm the fact that you're to... like paying attention, right? Like you're, you know what you don't know, right? Like there's that matrix, right? Yeah. Like you, the mm -hmm. known known, the unknown known, the unknown unknown, which is like, you don't yes. want to be there. Don't be there where you yeah. don't know what you don't yeah. know. 
Yeah, one of the greatest things, I don't know how long ago I learned this, but it's so much easier to like not pretend that you know something. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's either going to, like, someone's going to be a dick about it and you're going to be embarrassed. Get corrected. Yeah. 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 And they could do it in a nice way or they could do it in a not nice way. That's not fun. Or you're just going to shoot yourself in the foot because that's something that you're not learning. So might as well just say, like, oh, hey, like, what is that? I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> Maybe not in that way. <laughs> I don't say it like that. But I, I have a bunch of friends from school that graduated with me who were very savvy. I'm going to say savvy. I don't think they planned for it to be this way. I think that they were call it forced into it, or they saw it as the more attractive path. They use their culinary degrees as a competitive advantage in another discipline, whether that was getting involved with a wine program or starting a grocery brand or a path similar to yours, right? They found themselves starting a food mm -hmm. blog or being in food media. And as much as my friends and I, the ones who went straight to restaurants, kind of talk smack on those people because we were so restaurant dedicated, we were like the mm -hmm. restaurant people, a lot of those people who were savvy position themselves extremely strategically versus me trying to compete with the other 40 resumes at a hot restaurant in the world. So to take it back to your to your school days real quick, if 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 someone or even now, now that you know what you know, if someone is having a similar dilemma where they're like, you know, I've I've done this school thing, I did my externship, or I have some restaurant experience, if they're second guessing professional restaurant kitchens, if they're right for them or not, what advice would you give to them? Um, I think exactly what you were speaking to about with your friends, you know, um, that's absolutely a hundred percent what I benefited from is that if you are not sure that that's, you don't want to go to restaurants or you just know in your heart that maybe you'd like it for a few years and then maybe you get burnt out. That's a hundred percent. I saw that in my future and I didn't want that. I wanted to always love cooking. I, did, I didn't want to hate it ever. And so I wanted to find a way uh, to use, <laughs> use my degree, make it, you know, not a waste because it really was, it wasn't waste to me, but ideally you'd use it in your next profession is that just go for it. Just apply for whatever you want. And you saying that you've gone to culinary school, odds are no one else will say that. Well, yeah, my mom used to tell me. Yeah. I was, I was, you tell your story. I, there, there's, there's a, yeah. there's a point I want to make, which I think is really insightful, but I, I, I want to, I want, what, what were you, what were you talking about with your mom? Uh, my mom used to, she, it's, it's really funny that now, and I guess this is a, as you grow older kind of thing that you realize is that, um, my mom's really smart and has a lot of wisdom and, but you know, I always never wanted to do what she did. And so it always felt like whatever she was telling me wasn't applicable. So, uh, she used to always tell me, if you want to get into med school, be a dance major, because that's really unique. They're not going to get dance majors applying for med school. It's like, okay, cool, cool. And that's really what I did. <laughs> I got a culinary degree applying for a media job. And it was unique enough to get me an interview. So, I mean, advice to anybody, if you're thinking about it, just do it. Like, literally any job, just apply for it. If you want to do it, you know. The follow-up I had... For for, for that mm -hmm. question was going to be what resources were helpful for you during those crossroads. And it sounds like mom conversations are high on that list. Yeah. I'm the same. Mom, with my mom. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely. Yeah. Uh, if you can talk to my mom, she's pretty great. <laughs> I would recommend that. Um, it, the, the school, um, I think, uh, I will say this, uh, kind of going back to your original question. Um, I think their uh, professional development team, their career and academic advising department is definitely set up for people going to restaurants. Like that's what they do, their bread and butter. Great if you wanna do that. If you don't, not really their area. So if, if you're in a culinary school, if you're maybe at CIA, if you talk to maybe one of like the deans or even just a chef that you're close with and just say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. like. I don't think I want to go through this. Odds are that they have either their own life experience or they know somebody who kind of did that, but like they're going to be able to give you insight into what you could possibly do. At the very least, it's just a sounding board. Sure. I think it's so funny that the point I was going to make earlier was 
I think it's so funny, the paradox of people will justify going to culinary school because it will give them a myriad of opportunities. And you see these brochures that mm -hmm. say there's thousands of jobs in food that are available, or maybe yeah. maybe it's hundreds. <laughs> and then paradoxically, when it comes to changing, they box themselves into thinking that restaurants or catering or hotels mm -hmm. are the only options on the table. And it's just like all this creative you know, juice that you have when you're applying or trying to justify the price or thinking through like, is this right for yeah. me? Just goes out the window for some reason. And I think that's just a funny mm -hmm. paradox. And I wanted to comment on that. You are incredibly insightful as a human being. <laughs> I am learning so quickly. I mean, I already knew, but it's through conversations it. like this. I mean, yeah. I, again, I, I, I like talking to you and I, and Ray, because it's, it's like the the, the programs that you guys went through at CIA were completely different from what I went through. And it's not completely different. Like, there are different educations. But, um, you know, like, we didn't have the connect thing. Like, I had maybe, like, one or two people that I could talk to in oh, career cool. resources that always told me, don't go to a restaurant that's not going to pay you for your externship. And, you know, eh, we don't really like Thomas Keller restaurants because they don't take it they we had this issue with this one guy who tried to sue them and then now we're on bad terms and and so it was always like I was and, and it caused me this weird psychological distancing from all those resources at the school because it was like they told me no and so I told myself like oh so I have to do this myself kind of thing like I have to go out and hunt for this yeah. information mm -hmm. and I think that caused me to not take advantage of forming those relationships with my chefs at the school and you yeah. know, like doing, doing the due diligence that probably, you know, like I got the jobs regardless. Cause I just like went, mm -hmm. I tried to go straight to the source, like just make a beeline for the chef you want to work for. Yeah. Um, and so that's just, I don't know. It, it, it's always interesting, like this hindsight stuff and just comparing experiences and, um, all of that. It's wonderful. I, yeah. And it, it's crazy to hear how much, I mean, even in my time there, I was there for three and whatever years and, like the associate's program I went through was not the associate's program it was when I graduated from bachelor's, which is a like if you think about it in the terms of like traditional colleges that take eons to change anything, that's great that they're able to do it. But it's just it's like I I had no idea that there wasn't even like a culinary connect. Yeah. When you were there, and that really really wasn't that long ago if you mm -hmm. think about it. So. Yeah, relatively speaking, I. It's, it's yeah. really top of mind for me because I'm, I'm working on a course. So I'm working on a course. And, and that's part, partially why I asked if you felt like there was anything mm -hmm. missing uh, from culinary mm -hmm. school. Because this course I'm working on is, is, to, is designed to either be taken in tandem with culinary school or, mm -hmm. you know, if you just jump into a restaurant. And this is like a bit of a shameless plug, but it's designed in a way where once you buy the course, you can take future cohorts for free. So it's like if the course material gets better, oh, yeah. you can come back and go through a session again. Or if you had a module that you really liked, like in two years, you can come back and see what's changed, uh, what might have been updated and all that sorts of stuff, which I think is like completely missing from these like larger institutionalized educations. And yes. the Internet's going to destroy it's going to rip it to pieces in a good way. Like mm -hmm. I hope that people can yeah. get a better education. Um, well, that's a wonderful thing that you're doing it. And I mean, it doesn't take a genius to realize why they don't do that. <laughs> I know. I know. But it's, I mean, I think we're kind of all working towards, you know, actually putting something out that's good for people, not just good for you. Um, I had, and I think that's really wonderful. I put together some quick fire pulling behind the curtain at the Babish Culinary Universe questions. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of like go through those. I have like one more large big picture question. And then I have like actual rapid fire questions for you. Are you okay, okay. to go into some? Okay, cool. Yeah. So I noticed on TikTok that you guys do coffee in the mornings together. Do you guys do like an actual staff meal in the, in the kitchen on shoot days? Yes. So, okay. Funny story. Uh, I don't drink coffee really. So I watch them drink coffee. Nice. I'm, uh, it's so, it's incredibly sweet. They offer it to me so sincerely every single morning and every single morning I say no, because it's not really true. I drink coffee, but like with like three tablespoons of maple syrup, I just feel like that's not like a professional thing to bring <laughs> into my day. Um, so I'm like, yeah, I know it's fine. Plus it's good for me to drink water, but we do all have lunch together pretty much. I mean, more or less every day I want to say, um, and we have our traditions. We 
we try to order something um, healthier. And I mean, sometimes we'll eat what we're shooting, but a lot of times it's not ready. Um, so we'll order like salads or something. And then we go into the office slash green room and um, we put on uh, the Colbert report. <laughs> yeah, is that what it's called? Yeah. Stephen Colbert. Yeah, That's what I know. Exactly. And we watched I think it that might just be called during... Stephen Colbert. I don't know. I'm not going to misspeak. Really? I'm not going to mis- misquote the facts. Colbert I'm Report. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> that with the man called yeah. Stephen Rupert. Whoa. I just, I just ran song. <laughs> okay, Jess is going to get mad at me. Cause, like... But anyways, it's Stephen Colbert. And we watch it every day at lunch. And it's his monologue from the previous night. And we love it. And it's our little tradition. And it's like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And it's enough for us to eat and like chill and like get our heads out of it, and then we go back in. Do you have a favorite episode of Binging with Babish that you either showed your parents before you got the job or you watch it for inspiration from his previous catalog? Um, yeah, one the first one that comes to mind, it's my mom's like favorite episode. Every time she wants to brag about it, this is what she tells people to watch. And it's Ramdam from Parasite. Um, it's just a great episode and like it taught me things and it was just, it was from a great movie. It's like one of those like pure moments of like, this is what the show's about, you know? And yeah, no, I love it so much. And then I also love his mac and cheese basics. That's just because I always want to eat mac and cheese. So I guess a follow-up to that is, is there a video that you think absolutely needs a follow-up, but that follow-up doesn't exist yet? So he he's done some like episodes <laughs> it's hard to so we're like developing uh <laughs> it's like so fun to be like part of secrets but then yeah. it's not fun when like when you have someone one- inter- interviewing you to, about your secrets <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I'll, yeah it's I just mean, as it's, much my fault as <laughs> no no but it like feels like you know like when like famous youtubers are like guys i'm working on a project but like <laughs> Can't you say what it. yet yeah and right now it feels like i'm like trying really hard to be that way <laughs> and i really want to say i'm not doing that but i am hey ndas oh. crabby patty secret yeah. formula whatever you want to call it Ugh. oh okay an easy question that answer to your question anything spongebob Got i it. love doing spongebob episodes um a because spongebob is like really near and dear to my heart um but also because it's so creative they when they wrote that show they didn't have to have any sense of realism at all it's also under the sea so seafood ingredients are like something baking or a pizza How? it's really fun i really yeah, love yeah. those yeah i love those okay seafood and pizza kind of makes sense i'm going to take that one back but still you get what i'm going to say uh, again, this is more behind the curtains questions. You can say no if the NDA will, you know, legally abide you to certain <laughs> restrictions. I, I did notice that the brand just launched a TikTok. And again, you don't have to share behind the door conversations if you can't. But I guess from what you can share, what are those strategic conversations between you guys like when you're evaluating new platforms or new opportunities because as a small team you only have so many hours in a day and so many resources and so many things you can focus on before things get scattered so I guess what what is that like so in the case of TikTok um I think it's and me being um an old lady in my soul um it's hard for me to grapple with new social medias um, but for, for a company, for someone like Andrew, who has like a million projects going on at once, um, taking the time to like launch something like that, it's just, you know, he, he, we've talked about it before, but this is when it's happening now. So as much as I'd like to say it was like a strategic moment to do that now, um, I think it's more so that it's, it was right time, right place. And we has, it's been crazy it's really it's fun um I'm, I don't have a huge hand in it because like I said I don't really get the vision but other people have the vision and it's really fun I like I love seeing the end result I like the they're awesome the, I, I watched a bunch of them before we hopped on this call and I really enjoy them <laughs> so that was nice can you 
I mean, the cookware line just came out too. Again, speaking yeah. of, of a jillion different projects, what was yes, watching that yeah. process unfold like for you? So that doing the shoot was really fun. And sometimes Andrew won't have me come in for things that aren't like, like recipes where like I need to have a lot of things, but he had me come in for the shoot. And I was really glad he did because it was really like, it was like being on the set of a true like advertising campaign. It was really fun. It was only, I mean, it was only probably like two afternoons. Um, but again, uh, we had a, a director and videographer come up from Nashville to help shoot it. Um, they brought in, like, we got fancy cameras and different lenses, and I'm probably saying the wrong things, but um, it was really fun to be a part of that. And it was really beautiful because, you know, on my end, like since I started working there, we've been getting prototypes and Andrew's really committed to, you know, as we all should be putting out something that's good. And like, he really, we've been working on these tools, like with these pans, I shouldn't say pans. Uh, we've been working with these measuring cups <laughs> and bowls uh, for months now to really make sure that they're a quality product and what, what is part of the overall uh, brand mission. And so seeing it actually like come to life and like be available for people um, was really fun. And also, ah, yes, this is coming out in the future. Okay, the um, product videos, on Amazon, watch uh, all of them because they're amazing. They are true. So works smart, them. you guys are so smart. Oh, I went through a horrible me. process with Amazon videos stuff because oh. it's like I tried to repurpose my gear videos and just upload them. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you know the runaround of it. Of like, you can't talk about subscribing, you can't talk about liking the video, you can't talk about other products. You have to just talk about that product. And when you're launching your own product, that totally makes sense. But for a you know tiny little reviewer like me on the internet, it doesn't really make sense to reshoot everything that I've ever made. Um, exactly. Yeah, people smarter than me who are you know do this kind of thing, they figured that out. And so it was just you know from the get go that's what we had to do. Um, but it was all very um, as these things typically aren't. But this was very uh, improvised. Um, and they're wonder they're meant, to, I hope they go someplace. I hope he puts them up on the channel or someplace, but they really deserve to be not hidden in Amazon. But, uh, if you find the Easter eggs, they're beautiful. They're meant to be watched together. I don't think you have to worry about them not being seen because Amazon's really pushing for it. Like they want content oh. on the product pages. Like they're really trying to do everything they can to incentivize people to make video content. Like people like me yeah. who talk about other people's mm -hmm. products and I can only assume yeah. on your guys' end when you're launching a new one, it's like mm -hmm. content, content, content. So good on them. Good on you guys. Hopefully. Yeah. It's yeah. I, that's been really fun. Last like big question and then we'll do some rapid fire mm -hmm. ones to wrap up. I can, I can only You've already shared that you, that you're learning a ton on the job right now, but you you have this very interesting, call it a cocktail of fascinations with performing, and your sense of humor is very unique. Like that's what I've learned not just through this conversation, but just like mm -hmm. listening to you in general, and then obviously production and food. If do you do you have a north star right now? Obviously, you're super happy where you are, but like, what do you have your sights set on given? that the opportunities in this area seem to be like unfolding in front of your feet as you're stepping. Right. Yes. Um, I guess I'm in the first point in my life that, um, I'm kind of in a situation where, um, I really don't even know what the possibilities are, you know, like it, it's an ever changing industry, but also especially in food media and what's even happening on our own channel. Um, that I don't, I don't really know. And that's so exciting to me. Um, I mean, I, I like to do more on camera things, but that's like kind of more like a general <laughs> direction. Um, I mean, that's what I love to do. Um, but I also really loving like the video planning aspect that I'm kind of doing more of now. Like I'm, I'm, it's making, as I've mentioned before, my math brain side, um, really happy to like, you know, put things in boxes and say, this is when this happens. And, you know, it, it's, I, one time, a long time ago, probably, that's not true, like six months ago, um, I tried to make like a timeline, uh, like an old classic 
culinary school t- timeline for a shoot. <laughs> and it went so badly because like shooting a recipe is entirely different than like just making a recipe. And that was a really great learning experience <laughs> for me. And I, I'm learning now how to more make schedules and things like that. But um, yeah, so a- as far as uh, goals, I want to stay with the channels as long as Andrew will have me. Um, I say that now. I don't know. Knock on wood. Yeah, it's going to change. It's going to change but, and evolve. But if, if yeah. even if like, I don't know, through the people that you're working with, um, I mean, like for me, the first time I opened, um, I didn't even know when I went to culinary school that I what mm-hmm. what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted kind of a restaurant, but the second that I opened up the Alinea cookbook, I was like, that's what I want that. Like, that's definitely mm-hmm. what I want. So I was just yeah. to, t- to possibly tease out if you've seen... Uh, I see this person who launches brands for chefs exclusively and Mm -hmm. I want to do that. Or if something had Mm -hmm. stuck out in your mind, but it sounds, I mean, like you're in a great place to be learning, uh, you know, and absorbing all those things, but just curious Mm -hmm. if something had come up. Cause I know that that's not always like frequently shared cause you kind of play those, those dreams close to the chest sometimes, but you, yeah, you get it. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, I don't want to like impose my will, if that makes sense. Yeah. But um if it's going to be a new thing, like there's a certain element of having to like create the reality, yeah. right? Where it's yeah. it's not going to yeah. be presented to you or, or um like your your resume is going to do you no good, right? Like it's going to be the skills that you bring when you get to that point where you want to, you know, potentially um do something that's that's new and never before seen before. Um yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. I I I guess for me, I'm kind of at a place where I'm trying to keep myself from going to the same old habits of problem solving, which I don't have a problem. So maybe that's why I'm finally evolving. But um, I-, I want time to figure out what that new thing I can want is, if that you makes have, sense. Yeah, you have tons of time, like I said before. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do some rapid fire questions. Yeah. Which ones? What is a what is a book that's been particularly impactful in your career, if any come to mind? Okay, the one that just came to mind is not. No, nope, can't say it. <laughs> Ooh, come back to that one because it's yeah. not coming to me. All yep. good. Is there a a technique that you're still intimidated by in the kitchen? Stupid things like um, just things I've never done before or seen before. Um, and I work very hard to not have stress about those things. But like uh, 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 killing a lobster. Totally. A lot of anxiety about that one. Totally. Yep. Um, I also don't like cutting chicken bones, but that's, that's beside the point. What is that's one not... thing? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. no that's fine. <laughs> what, is, what is one thing that you've changed your mind on in recent memory? I, for a long time, always thought that I wanted to be a part of a big company, um, something secure. Corporate. There's a, there's a path written mm. for you already. And I, I've, which is really funny. I think I thought that for a really long time, um, you know, growing up in a really structured childhood that that's kind of expected of what I would do and I think in the back of my head I always thought that's what it because it's easier to not have to think about what you're going to do if you have someone telling you what you're supposed to do um and I guess just literally working for a small company I've I've really learned that having that freedom um is so much better you know I, I don't have to settle ever not to say again as we've talked about before that there aren't things I don't like but yeah not having n- n- giving myself that freedom. That's a great answer. You, you're, you're tricky to ask this question to because you don't have a ton on your Instagram, but the the question, the question, I'll ask the question and then you can adjust it for, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever platform you choose. So the question is, what is something that doesn't end up on your Instagram as in you don't share it widely with the public, but you get really excited about it or you love it? Uh, yeah. So it's weird because I obviously work for a social media enterprise, um, and I'm kind of social media inept. Um, I actually didn't have an Instagram until about a year ago. Um, and my friend, Sarah, 
Shout out to Sarah. Um, she, Sarah, shout out to Sarah. <laughs> um, she like forced me to make one. Um, and that, that was it. Yeah. So I don't have a lot on my Instagram, but, um, I really just, um, I really kind of love tiny little vignettes of like sketch comedy. It's, I love it. And sometimes like, I don't know, I'm just inspired, inspired by something, whatever. And it's like totally off brand and like, not why I feel like people have like followed me basically they fault me because I, I was brander and I'm part of the channel and I get that so I feel like that's like weird for me to post because that's like not what they're here for <laughs> Plus, it's like putting myself out there you get it explain to me what that is a comedy vignette um just like a series of like photos or like small like inter like videos sometimes but just like that uh, tell a story got it that's funny I got guess it. is the way to put it got it yeah and I just I I I like to do those things but exactly what an old lady would say <laughs> i know i know basically if it was black and white no sound that's it <laughs> that's ideal <laughs> how how do you make your eggs in the morning for yourself and the way that i kind of frame this for people that get some fun answers is like it's a saturday morning and you just kind of woke up you didn't have a coffee because kendall doesn't drink coffee but how do you make your eggs um so uh boring answer is that when i have eggs I do classic scrambled egg, like what you learn in culinary school. But my like go-to Saturday morning breakfast when like I don't really want to go into the whole spiel where I have things to do. Um, toast, sourdough toast, cream cheese, bread and butter pickles that my dad makes, and um, flaky salt. And that's really my favorite thing in the whole world. Interesting. That, yeah. Has not been shared on the podcast before. So that's a first. Um my boyfriend literally looks at me in disgust every time I eat it um, because I get it. Cottage cheese is like not the best thing in the world, but to me it is. And then the pickles, I don't know. I don't know where that's from. I need to apologize because I feel like I mispronounced his name in the intro for you. It's Teo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's spelled, spelled Theo, but it, yeah, it's Teo like Teo. Got it. Got it. Got it. That's helpful. So I'm saying it right now, Teo. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah. What do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? I think it's uh, already happening on a certain level, um, but kind of being more receptive to building communities within kitchens. And that's emphasizing learning, relationships, you know, with the well-being health of you know your coworkers, your employees um i th i think that that's you know, the single greatest thing that you know the, the culinary industry in general can do to kind of come on the level of all the other industries you know have kind of reached today yeah because it's almost baked in right with other industries and offices and company yeah. culture and yeah all that stuff mm -hmm. I just asked you a ton of questions. Are there questions you had for me or topics that you wanted to, to cover or talk about before we kind of wrap up? Well, not that I picked it out, but you did give me a piece of advice earlier. And if you have anything else, I think um, you, you've, your, your questions and just the way you give feedback, you're very, like you insight, it's more than insightful. You're very perceptive person and you see the truth in a lot of situations um and i'm just wondering if you see anything that you think i need to hear that's a very selfish question it, that's <laughs> it's only you and me on this call so that's <laughs> that's that's all good and i, I appreciate you you saying mm -hmm. that that's that's kind and that's what i i hope to to bring to to everybody that i that i hopefully speak with i think that this is a little bit like the valedictorian asking for study advice because you you <laughs> have clearly landed like an, an an extremely good opportunity and you're you're taking advantage of it and you you're doing you're doing so much right i think you're and and the other thing is like it's not just the the in the work work that you're doing it's also like the personal psychoanalyzing yourself stuff like usually i look to do that with other people like i i like to look into people's mm -hmm. motivation. I, I had a, and this is, I'll bring this up because it's funny in CIA terms. 
There's a class that I took right after externship, and it was one of the book classes where we would just sit there, and I think it was talking about, like, staff management or something like that. And the instructor that I had at the time wrote one word on the board, and I just, like, I couldn't pay attention for the rest of that class because the only thing I was thinking about was how can I get good at that, and the word that they wrote down was motivation. And at the time, because I was like the bottom of the totem pole kind of thing, and I constantly went through these ups and downs of like, this sucks, like I'm waking up at 5 a.m. to go in and fry chestnuts and peel them when my (laughs) fingers are burning, and I'm then going into picking 10 bunches of spinach, and then I get yelled at by the sous chef, like, and so motivation, and, and he explained it in a way that was like, motivation is the thing that drives human behavior. And I was like, I acknowledge that this is like a very human centered Mm -hmm. industry. And so if I can, and I did the math, I was like, if I can get good at motivation, I can motivate people well. And then if I motivate people well, then I can build whatever I want. Um, Where was I going with that? Um, No, I love it. Like your butt. Yeah. So, so um, I mean, advice for you, I, that's, I mean, it's partially why I asked that question of like you having a North star and what you can build with this, because what that will do for you, even if it doesn't exactly map to what you do, it will allow you to kind of like identify opportunities that can, could potentially get you closer to there. And then you know what to grab for, right? Because it's I, I'm a very visual analyzing person. And so like through all these shoots that you're doing with the cookware line and TikTok being launched and more YouTube stuff and collaborations and all that stuff. It's like, it's like a sushi conveyor belt coming by you. You know what I mean? There's tons of stuff. And if you know, and that's why it was so helpful for me to have three Michelin star restaurant in Chicago as part of my, that was my North star. And so it was like everything that I, everything that orbited me was focused on getting me closer to that thing. And I obviously never ended up doing it. I'm living in a completely different city without a restaurant, you know, like didn't even get me like I didn't even get close. But having it was really helpful because it allowed me to pick what I wanted off the sushi conveyor belt, you know, and then it's like then I built my tray and I sat down and I ate it and I said, you know, this isn't really for me. I kind of want to move on. And this is again, it's not something strange to you, but don't let up off the gas, I guess, is what I would share with you is like. Yes, you have a great position, and yes, like the opportunities are insane, but it's like, and and then and then the other. So that's the first piece, and then the second piece mm-hmm. was, don't discount how helpful you can be to other people, from the sense of, there's if you if you know you want to do this in food, and you know you want to work with chefs, and you know you want to do this thing with media, like, we're coming into we're rounding the corner on this idea that chefs have to be the ones that do everything. And I think we're going to start to, I mean, the first big, like huge name that did it was Will Gadara and Daniel Hoom of like the front of house guy got put on the cookbook with the chef, like huge, like, and I think we're going to see it more. Um, I tell the story of like the original co-founders of the restaurant that I worked at in Norway. It was five people. It was two chefs two bartenders and a musician and they all had 20 percent equity in the company and they eventually all got bought out and now it's just the chef so it's like you can see kind of where the gravity pools people Mm -hmm. but it's like the idea of you being able to be on an opening team of a cool restaurant project or um insert cool brand that you like happens to want to open a restaurant because it's a very real thing that brands are doing now And they need someone to produce the content that's going to accompany this restaurant project or whatever. So it's like, and don't be afraid to like really go for it. Like really, and and I know you mentioned you're a dreamer, so I don't think this will be difficult for you, but literally just like write it out. I mean, for me, again, I'm talking about like a year, maybe not even a year, six months after I picked up the Alinea cookbook, I told myself I was going to have a three Michelin star restaurant in Chicago. So I basically told myself and the people around me that I was going to compete with Grant Ackett's, which is just like stupid. Like that is crazy bonkers bizarre. Mm-hmm. And at the time, it's just like I did it because it like it gave me the ability to to make thought better choices. Like I could make decisions 
more thoughtfully and cleaner and know what to say no to. Because, like, it's so hard to watch your friends in culinary school talk about the fact that, like, I went to this country club and they let me cook the grill and I was making steaks every night and I was, like, Mm -hmm. having to juggle, like, cooking all this meat for this party that came through and the governor came to eat, blah, 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 blah. And I came back from my externship and I was, like, Mm -hmm. I picked herbs for six months, (laughs) you know? Yeah. In a sense. And so so those, those two pieces, I think, would probably be, like, and, you know... You folks got to see like a real coaching call. Like I do this with real people. Um, mm-hmm. It's like a huge passion of mine because it's again to your point about like community mentorship. Like really getting into the nitty gritty of what people want. Like I like I like this stuff, and I wish that I could have called someone who had some experience to chat with. Um, so I don't know. Do you have thoughts there? Like, did any of that resonate? Is it helpful? Like, that's the value of being able to talk about this stuff. Is yeah. it's not just. It's not just me sending it off into the ether and then you read it and you're like, oh, okay, maybe I'll do that. No, no, no. I, um, I, I think a lot of that rang true for me, especially I think since, um, since I've gotten my job, uh, it's obviously, it's been a big deal and people are like, wow, it's so great, especially on, you know, the coattails of a pandemic and just getting hired at all but in the field I want to be in and this like once in a lifetime opportunity for me, I kind of feel like, wow, I've, like I, I got to what I wanted to do. And then it's like a, a plateau kind of thing where mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm, I like, I don't, I don't want to be like always looking to what's next and not enjoy what I'm doing. But I also don't want to lose sight of ambition, I guess. Um, so, so that was really helpful to hear. Do you, and, 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 I'm only saying don't lose sight of the fact that you could be a part of a bigger team because, you know, just you might get a lot of advice from people that say, oh, well, you worked on Binging with Babish. You should go the route that um, are you familiar with Jack Coyne? He's also a New York City creator. He was behind the scenes with Casey Neistat for like years and years and years. He was the content guy for Beam, which was his social media app that he launched. Mm -hmm. And he left Beam launched his own YouTube channel and instantly got like a hundred thousand subscribers because Casey shared his video. There's also, um, this guy named Babin. His last name's Babin, Tyler Babin. He was a videographer for Gary V for a long time. Again, worked behind the scenes on daily V did his whole daily vlog thing. Uh, followed the guy around for ages and ages, edited the stuff, was responsible for a lot of the branding for Gary left Vayner media to go launch his own channel And, you know, instantly got, like, the Adobe creative residency thing and went on to be this, like, video creator guy. I'm saying that advice because I think that you might be told, and you might have already gotten this already, that, like, oh, Kendall, you should create your own channel. Or you should should be the Mm -hmm. face of this thing. And if your performance background and your acting background is pulling you towards that, like, absolutely lean into it. Do it. But if you're acknowledging that, like, you have strengths in other areas, don't, like, find someone else who wants to be the face or Mm a group of people that want to be the face. And you can just do all the things that you love. You know, like, my Mm -hmm. company, uh, our, I think our third hire was was an operations specialist person. She is now our chief operations officer. But it's because it's, like, the two things that my business partner and I don't like doing. And she has, like, a seat at the table for everything. Like, we gave her equity. Like, there's there's tons of, like, oper- – it, it's – the pe- and it that has to speak to you. You know, I can't, I can't mm-hmm. tell you that. Yeah. But um, just don't think – like, there's tons of and, – and it only comes from the fact that you're working with such a huge creator who I'm sure, based on how you speak with him and how he seems as a person, would completely put you on blast if you came to him – in six months and said, you know, I want to start my own channel and I want to do this own, I want to do my own thing. Um, and so I guess like, just keep those things in mind because, um, yeah, I, I I don't want, I don't like it when people get it twisted that they have to Mm -hmm. fall into a box just because it's natural Mm -hmm. or, you know, it would make sense. Cause that, that's the worst, right? Where you see someone start a channel off of get just being able to get clout or whatever but then also and and this is where like the counterintuitiveness of of the the advice rings true of like an audience is one of the most like 
you can pop and swap it for anything. You know, like if you have an engaged audience and you know this, like you can direct them towards a line of cookware uh, Mm -hmm. at the drop of a hat. And so I find it hard to believe that whatever you don't, and it comes with you, you know what I mean? Like you could Mm -hmm. write to those people and engage with them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you seem incredibly like emotionally intelligent as well. And so, you know, it's, it's keep, keep in mind that thing that I mentioned at the, at the start of the interview, which is like, you have a portfolio of opportunities and you, Mm -hmm. you're, you, you have just invested in Uber and it's doing incredibly well, you know? And so Mm -hmm. it's like, just keep riding that until it's, it's, it's ready to, you know, kind of cool down or you're ready to exit your position, quote unquote, to use like Mm -hmm. the investor analogy again. Um, (laughs) but yeah, I, I, I really think that you're doing fantastic and there's no reason to feel any sort of like imposter syndrome or like you're lacking uh because i think that you're clearly in a great spot um but yeah if i had to say anything that's what i would probably try to keep in mind Uh, thanks doesn't cover it (laughs) but thank you no that's where where do you want people to go like um to either get in touch with you or obviously see the channel like everything's going to be linked Mm -hmm. um but yeah where where can people come find you um yeah just instagram (laughs) granny here um yeah just instagram and also i respond to everybody that messages me so it's actually a weird a funny flex and i i hope to keep that for a long time as well like i liked responding to people like i like conversations like this and helping so yeah yeah and i'm only able to do like like andrew's telling me that like up until like you know, a few years ago, he's responded to every single person that he loved doing that. And now it's just at a point where like, he literally cannot do that. He would be, he wouldn't get anything else done in the day. Um, and I'm glad that in my little space that I can do that. So yeah. And also people don't message me that often. So that helps. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. What's up? Justin here again. Because, I mean, if you're still listening, you didn't not like this episode, right? And if that's the case, I'd like to think that you'd get value from the other work that I share here online. It's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week called the 80-20 Edge. That's where I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. And I say it saves time because I include all of the content that I published that week all in one place as kind of a weekly digest of sorts. Next up, you should check out my YouTube channel for gear reviews, clips from podcasts just like this one, and documented experiences from some of the best restaurants in the world. And lastly, if you'd like to learn about my intense cohort-based professional development focused course, get coaching from me to help you make your next move, or just support the show, you can check out justinconnacom slash support. And if you do support this show already, that's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Finally, it really does help to share a review of this show on Apple Podcasts to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.